Hey, wherever and whenever you're joining me, I'm glad you're here. And we're going to take a look at the subject of dealing with pain today. It's been a heavy week here at Williams Lake Alliance. There's been a lot of tragedy to absorb. And I've, um, I sometimes walk back and forth to work here at the church. And uh, as I walk through the streets of Williams Lake, this, especially this last week, I'm seeing the Halloween decorations. And Halloween is just this ongoing celebration of death. I mean, there's skeletons everywhere and fake gravestones in people's yards and, and zombie hands poking up through lawns and flower beds. And, and it's, it's just this celebration of death. But it's been a couple of weeks filled with death and loss and tragedy around here, uh, both at our church and in my life personally, just a lot of loss and disappointment to be dealing with. And I, I frankly don't need any more. And it reminds me, you know, when I was talking with a friend about Halloween and, and, and the increasing amount of decorations we see around us, it just reminds me that Halloween used to be the eve before All Saints Day. I mean, it was All Hallows Eve, the eve of All Hallows or All Saints Day. And it was a time for remembering the heroes of the faith. And I'd like to look at one of the heroes of faith with you today. We don't want to concentrate on death and loss, but that is the reality that we, some of us are dealing with right now. And uh, I want to look at a, a hero of the faith as he dealt with his own pain. There is one certain thing in your life and mine, and that is this, that either you have been through pain or you are in pain or you will experience pain. There is no running from pain in your life. I just want to imagine, and I hope you would imagine with me, what would it be like to, in the course of a day, lose everything that you had spent your life working for? I mean, business-wise, job-wise, you're finished. And at the end of that day of just devastating loss at work, you drive home to, you know, just be with your family and encourage your family. We're going to be okay. And and you find out on the drive home, there's a natural disaster that has cut right through your neighborhood and cut a swath right through your home. And rescue workers are walking out of the rubble of what was your home, one by one, carrying the bodies of your children. And later on, having absorbed all of that, clinging to God, But still devastated from your loss, you you suffer from a painful illness that affects your entire body. And when your agony could get no worse, your spouse, the, the one good thing that's left to you in this world, looks at you in all of that suffering with a cynical sneer and says, are you still holding on to God? He obviously hates you. Why don't you just get it over with and curse him and let him finish you off? Well, I'm talking, of course, about Job, one of the earliest characters in the Bible, maybe the earliest book of the Bible written. And when tragedy and crime and violence took everything that Job had, and then sickness and humiliation and pain and lack of sympathy affected him and attacked him personally, you know, he, he turned to God. If, if we face any one of those things, we complain. I complain. Job faced all of them in a short course of time. So I'd like to take a look at his story and then see what we can take from his story and apply in our, our own lives. Job chapter 1. I'm going to read chapter 1 through uh, the first 10 verses of chapter 2 in the book of Job. There was a man in the country of Uz named Job. He was a man of complete integrity, who feared God and turned away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His estate included 7,000 sheep and goats, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. Job was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns having banquets at their homes. 
They would send an invitation to their three sisters and eat and drink with them. I mean, this was a family that got together. It was the family dream. Siblings that wanted to spend time with one another. And it says in verse 5, And whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purify them, rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them. For Job thought, Perhaps my children have sinned, having cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, Where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity, who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household, and everything he owns? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns, and he will certainly, he will surely curse you to your face. Very well, the Lord said to Satan, everything he owns is in your power. However, do not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. And one day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and reported. While the oxen were plowing and the donkeys grazing nearby, the Sabians swooped down and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was still speaking when another messenger came and reported, God's fire fell from heaven. It burned the sheep and the servants and devoured them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. That messenger was still speaking when yet another came and reported the Chaldeans formed three bands, made a raid on the camels and took them away. They struck down the servants with the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, he was still speaking when another messenger came and reported your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on the young people so that they died, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshipped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And throughout all of this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. One day the sons of God came in again to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. He still retains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to destroy him for no good reason. Skin for skin, Satan answered the Lord. A man will give up everything he owns in exchange for his life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well, the Lord told, told Satan. He is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's presence and infected Job with terrible boils from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of pottery broken pottery to scrape himself while he sat among the ashes. And his wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. You speak as a foolish woman speaks, he told her. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? And throughout all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. And this is God's word, and we believe it. And it's true for us today. Lord, would you help us understand with our minds and be changed in our hearts by your word. Lord, speak, for your servants are, are listening to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the, the picture here is of a good man. Job is a good man. God is glorified by Job's life. And the blessings that God pours out on Job are part of God's glory. But then, I mean, that's, that's just it. It's but then. All the bad things happen to Job. And there's some really unhealthy ways that people can deal with pain when they experience loss and disappointment. And 
um, and, and go through the pains of life. Most of us don't deal with everything Job dealt with all at once, but we'll all deal with pain. Here's some unhealthy ways that people try to deal with pain. Um, number one, we, we get angry. People get mad. You know, I, uh, I read a few years ago about uh, some, uh, there's a business that's opened up for people who are going through pain and want to deal with it. And they're called rage rooms or anger rooms where you can go in, if you're over 18 and you, and you sign the waiver, you can go into a room that's stocked with, you know, old furniture or electronics or glassware or whatever it is. And with a, a, a baseball bat or an ax or whatever, you can just destroy stuff. And the idea is that you can safely vent your anger in this rage room. And it, apparently it's big business, or has been. And it feels good. It feels good to just wreck stuff. But as it turns out, it's not all that helpful. It might be fun. I mean, who doesn't like bashing stuff? But the idea is that venting is going to release your rage and, and, and get rid of your anger. You just got to get it out, and, and then you're going to be okay. But what researchers have discovered is that the venting, and some, some venting is, is, is okay, but um, if people look to that alone as their way to get rid of their hurts, it turns out to be just a way of rehearsing the things that they're angry about, and it multiplies and just compounds the anger. It doesn't heal the wounds. It actually just kind of feeds the wounds with the expectation of a quick fix. In Proverbs 29, 11, it says, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. Now, there's a place for, you know, just letting out that raw scream. There's a place for, you know, throwing something. <laughs> but, but if we look to that alone, and if we look to that always... It's actually going to feed and fester and doesn't make us better. Another way that people deal with hurt in their lives is through distraction. And, and you know, we can look to all kinds of things from simple pleasures to just sort of check out, you know. And it might, it might just, just be an overdose on Netflix or, you know, other forms of entertainment. Video games are huge and, or, or just simply busyness or shopping or other things that can turn into addictions. And those things, I mean, distraction, it, it works. It's effective, but it's temporary. And oftentimes what we find is that the problems that we're trying to distract ourselves from end up being no better when we get back to them and sometimes worse because we've neglected the things that will actually make things better. Distraction doesn't work as, as a strategy in the long haul. Another way that people deal with pain in their lives is uh, they turn to victimhood. And victimhood and self-pity, uh, it, it just kind of goes on perpetuating the why me kind of questions forever. And it ends up isolating us because a victim, a victim just isolates from other people. A, a victim paints themselves in this, in this sort of Eeyore tone and says, why me? My life is so hard. It shouldn't be me. And that just pushes people away. And it doesn't get us anywhere. It does not bring healing when we live as victims and say, this shouldn't have happened to me. And as I talk about anger and as I talk about distraction, as I talk about victimhood and self-pity, I'm talking about all of us because I've done those things. And probably every one of you has done those things. Another, another way that people deal with disappointment and hurt in their lives is cynicism and cynicism is living life just assuming the worst about everything and everyone of course everything's bad that's the way the world is it it, it goes from eeyore you know to just this dim view of life and ends up doing very little to make things better in proverbs 22 verse 13 it describes uh, kind of a self-pitying and cynical view of life the sluggard, the person who doesn't want to do anything, the sluggard says there's a lion outside. Like, I, I can't even go outside. It's all going to go wrong. I'm going to get eaten by a lion. Or I will be murdered in the streets. People are terrible. If I go out there and get involved in life, I, something bad could happen to me because people are terrible. And you know what? People are terrible. But often it's, it's this idea of becoming just more and more jaded with life. 
and so hardened that we don't want to feel anymore. It's a withdrawal that just seeks to protect self, and it's very tempting. And it can be, again, it can be effective in the short haul. It protects us from pain because it doesn't let anything in. But the problem is when we, when we harden our hearts against pain, we harden all the other feelings as well. And along with cynicism, along with cynicism comes a dying of joy, a dying to the ability to relate well to other people. All the other stuff that we're trying to protect ourselves from keeps us from actually enjoying what God has for us. And cynicism, cynicism is based in pride. Cynicism says only I can be trusted. Only I know what should really happen. And what I find is, in my own life experience, most of the things that have hurt me most in life, I never saw coming. And most of the things that have hurt me most in life, I probably couldn't have prevented, even if I did know they were coming. And by the way, cynicism and this jaded approach to life, it's one more of those things that feels good, kind of feels good, kind of feels like it's going to do you some good by protecting you, but it ends up being very bad for you. Researchers have found a link between cynical distrust and dementia. Researchers adjusted for other factors that could lead to dementia risk, things like high blood pressure and cholesterol and smoking. And they found that people with high levels of cynical distrust in their approach to life were actually three times more likely to develop dementia than people with low levels of cynicism. A positive outlook does you good, even if it burns you sometimes. A constant negative outlook that says, I don't want to be hurt by anything, so I'm going to keep myself closed off and assume the worst about everything, ends up hurting you more. Now, Jesus, Jesus knew exactly what people were made of. He, he wasn't blind to the facts. But he still made himself incredibly available and incredibly vulnerable to the very people that he knew could hurt him. Jesus washed the feet of the man that he knew would betray him to death. That's not a cynical or jaded way to live. That is a vulnerable and open way to live. And it's an invitation to real life. Now, you're going to do some of these things. I mean, anger and distraction and, and victimhood and self-pity and cynicism. Those are temptations that all of us have from time to time. And it's understandable that we're going to take those approaches. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, if you've done those things, it's okay. God understands. We will slip into those things. You're going to get mad sometimes. You're going to get cynical sometimes. You're going to want to guard yourself. You're going to distract yourself. And sometimes sitting down and doing nothing but watching a comedy so that you can forget about a terrible day, that's okay. But when we... When we dwell in those places indefinitely and when we begin to put our trust in those places to deal with our pain, to when we put our trust in those places to help protect us in our lives, well, it feels like it's going to help, but what it ends up doing is just feeding more of the same. Unhealthy ways of dealing with pain actually grow our pain rather than venting it or preventing it as we'd hope. So let's talk about some healthy ways to deal with pain. And we see some of those in the scriptures and particularly in the story of Job. Number one that I'd like to tell you, a healthy way to deal with your pain is to acknowledge it. Acknowledge your pain. How about you? How do you typically express hurt and loss and disappointment in your life? Because if you don't express it, you're actually lying. It does come out of us somehow, some way. For a lot of people, it comes out in the form of cynicism or anger or whatever it is. But it's going to come out somehow. And the healthy way is to acknowledge and express it. To actually take the time to grieve your losses, your hurts, and your disappointments. When I was going through an incredibly painful time in my life, one of my key mentors said, Chris, you need to mourn this. Not just grieve, but but to take it to the next level as you grieve and intentionally mourn your losses. And I did. And it was so freeing. It was the first step towards some real healing and health in my life. 
So if you're going through some stuff, if you've experienced loss, whether, you know, that's a disappointment, something you had to give up, something, some dream that died, or some relationship that was broken, or the death of someone close to you that you loved, mourn. Mourn well. And you can do that, one of the healthiest ways to do it is write it down. Write a letter to the thing that you miss or the person that you miss. Write it down. Write down how you feel. List your losses one by one and let yourself feel the feelings. A lot of people have never let themselves feel what they're feeling. They just want, they, 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 they feel something that doesn't feel good and they want to not feel that, so they move on to something else so they don't have to feel. And, and the healthiest thing you can do with your feelings because you're, you're not going to be damaged by a feeling. Feel that feeling. Dwell in it. Let yourself fully embrace the feeling that God has allowed you the, the gift of these emotions and acknowledge those things. Job acknowledges exactly how he's feeling. For all his losses. I mean he worships God. He praises God. But he also says in chapter 3 verse 1. He says I want it to end. I just want it to end. After this it says Job opened his mouth. And cursed the day of his birth. He said God I'm going through so much. I wish I hadn't even been born. He says why is light. Given to those in misery. And life. To the bitter of soul. To those who long for death that does not come. Who search for it more than for hidden treasure. Who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave. He says, why, why do you keep me alive when this life is so terrible? And Job says, this doesn't feel fair. In chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, he says, I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me, but tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands when you smile on the schemes of the wicked? That is, that is a really big statement to make. I loathe my life. God, why are you letting this happen? What charges do you have against me? Why does it seem to please you when everything goes wrong for me? You know what? It's okay to say that to God. It's in the Bible for a reason. God knows what's going on in your heart. And maybe the health, healthiest thing to do as a start, not to, not to dwell there forever, but as a start, is to let yourself feel what you're feeling and acknowledge that to God. In fact, the, the warrior poet David shows us how to take pain to the right place. In Psalm 13, he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? Uh, The author Christopher Wright points out that whereas we often ask why, people in the Bible so often shifted to a better question than why. And they asked, how long? How long? And David here is saying, things are going wrong for me. God, I I don't understand. I don't feel like you exist right now. He feels so alone. And by the way, loneliness can be the worst of all pain. Uh, you You can endure an awful lot if you feel like you're surrounded by good supports. But to feel alone is terrible to endure. And so along with acknowledging your pain, the next healthy thing we can do is ask for help. In Psalm 13, David asks for help. He says, look on me and answer, O Lord, give light to my eyes. There are times when you are just so overwhelmed with the weight of grief, with the pain of disappointment and loss, That everything seems like darkness. Job curses the day he was born. David says, God, give light to my eyes. That darkness, when it descends on us, can cause a a clouded perception of what's really going on. and, And a loss of perspective that makes it feel like 
everything is an absolute catastrophe. And you might not know that struggle of the constant darkness, but for some it is very, very real. And David and Job turn to the right place. They ask God for help. David asked God for light. Just give me some signal that you're still there. Now, God can speak straight to your soul, but oftentimes he ends up sending help in the form of a friend. Now, Job had some friends that, that, that grieved with him for a time, and then they started getting it wrong, and, and their thinking was messed up. But, but for a solid week, they sat with him so that he wasn't alone. And David had encouragers and friends that God sent into his life. And what if we learn anything here, it's that when we are most tempted to turn away from God and, and to isolate ourselves from other people, that's when you need to run toward God. That's when you need to say help. That's when you need to welcome others. And so wait for him. Don't just get busy. Don't just look for distraction. Acknowledge your pain. And ask for help. And then thirdly, affirm your faith. For too many people, you know, pain makes them wonder, is God good or is God even real? Uh, one of the biggest objections to the idea that God exists or that God is trustworthy is pain, is suffering, is the evil that we see going on in the world around us. And at some point in everybody's life, we, we, we arrive at a choice Either God is all that he says he is, or he isn't. Either he's not good, he isn't good, or he just isn't there. And I'll, I'll put it this way bluntly, and I've said this before. If God's not there, if God's not either good or real, then you don't need him. Then move on. But if he is real, you need him more than anything else. We've got that same choice that David had, that Job had. And when we arrive at that, that climax of tension where we either hold on to our faith or let it go entirely, you know, curse God and die. If we hold on, our faith can grow and we can heal. In Psalm 13, verse 5, David says, After all of this pain... After all the questioning and, and, and the God, would you just give light to my eyes? He says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I trust. Now, that's a choice. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. There's the question for us. In those times of pain and loss and suffering, and when we see the evil, and when we're tempted to give in to anger, or cynicism, or distraction, or addiction, or self-pity and victimhood. What will you trust to be the thing that helps you in that moment? What will you trust? I, I, I trust in my unfailing brains. I'll figure this out. I trust in my unfailing wealth. I trust in my unfailing words. I, I trust in my connections. I trust in my strength or my charm or my stubbornness, that I'm just a fighter. And Job doesn't trust in any of those things. Job runs to God. And David trusts in God's love. And he can rest in God's salvation. They both made a decision that they would cling to faith more than to anything else. And from that point on, God's light began to creep in to their dark place. See, if you conclude, if someone concludes, as so many people are sadly doing, that God is not good or that God is not real, then the real question is, who will you turn to with your questions? What, what will you put your trust in? In those times, where will you find any sense of meaning in your tragedies? Where will you go with your why? If there is no God, oh, but there is and you can run to him. And then finally. After we acknowledge our pain and ask for help and affirm faith. 
Finally, the encouragement is to accept what you cannot change. In the end of the book of Job, and it's a long book, in the end, after Job's questioning and his, you know, shaking his, I, I won't say shaking his fist at God, but calling out to God and, and, and saying, why is this happening? Give me an answer. In the end, God challenges Job. And he describes his rule over all of creation, over all created things, and he questions Job's power to control or even comprehend what's going on in the cosmos, in all of creation. In chapter 40 of the book, in verses 15 to 18, he says, look at the behemoth. His bones are tubes of bronze. I mean, he's really big. He's really strong. His limbs are rods of iron. And he's saying the behemoth, whatever that is, is it's too big to control. You can't, you, you can't control something that big, that strong. In verse 40, chapter 41, in verses 1 to 8, he talks about the Leviathan, some kind of sea creature. Can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? He says, if you lay a hand on him, you'll remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing him is false. He's too fierce to fight. You can't fight something that big, he's saying. Now, the, the question is, what are the behemoth? What is Le Leviathan? Are, are they symbolic? Uh, not likely in the context of created things. God seems to re be referring to real things that Job has no control over. The weather, you know, the stars, and all those kind of things. And some, some people have suggested Le Leviathan and behemoth are, are referring to the hippopotamus and the crocodile, which makes sense. They're big, they're strong, they're, they're really dangerous and hard to control. Uh, it's possible. Um, or, or some have suggested that it might even be picturing now extinct creatures that Job may have known when he lived in his lifetime. Uh, but whether it's a hippo and a crocodile or a dinosaur, God's message here is the same. And that is this. Job, there are things that are too big for you to tangle with. There are things that are too big for you to blame for what they do. They just are. I mean, I can remember a time where I was trying to work on a project and the wind came up and was frustrating me so badly. It was just whipping my tools and my stuff around and keeping me from, from completing things. It just, it would tear things out of my hand and, and I got so angry, so frustrated, so mad and I just wanted to scream and I did. But how do you get angry at the wind? Like, what will that accomplish? Can you stop it? Uh, you, you don't blame a, a crocodile for being mean. You don't blame a dinosaur for being big. You don't blame the ocean for being wet or the wind for blowing or the sun for being hot. You, you, you can't blame those things and you can't change those things. You have to learn to live with them. And what God is getting at with Job and what he challenges me and you with is this idea of what do you see as your list of unfair sufferings and who or what do you blame for those things and will that blame change anything the reality is probably not probably not there are some some things that just are what they are and it's hard and it's painful and it's disappointing but your anger at those things and your blame of those things is not going to change them and Job, at this point, does the one thing that will bring him peace and that can bring us peace. He takes back his blame of God and of the things that he's gone through, and he just lets God be God. Job chapter 42, verse 3 says, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. And, and at that point, at that point, God does what only God can do. He vindicates Job and he restores Job's life. And that reminds me that pain is a season. Pain is a season. In Psalm 126, it, it says, Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Sowing and reaping. Sometimes we, we don't feel like we want to get out of bed. 
you know, but a farmer knows um, that if he wants to eat in the winter, he needs to sow seed in the spring. Sometimes you just have to do it. Take the next step. And when you can't do anything, when, you know, you live off of those reserves. Sometimes it's the winter and you're just living off the reserves of what you've built up until then. Which is why when times are good, it's so important to build faith so that there's something there for you when the winter comes. But when you can do something, even if it's not much, there is something so healthy about just going out and taking the next step, even if that's all you can do. The farmer sows in tears while he's still hurting. He does something that needs done. And the promise is that the suffering will pass and we will be better off for having done what we can during that time. And, and by the way, taking time to be here, to look into this with me right now, this is part of the sowing. It's part of the preparing for the inevitable times of winter. But the seasons are temporary and they will pass. And your story is also part of a bigger story. You know, Job didn't know about the conversation between Satan and God. We get that glimpse into what was going on in the spiritual realm. Job didn't. Job didn't know what was at stake. Job didn't know the larger picture. God never showed him that larger picture. And I believe that God didn't show him because God usually doesn't show us. Just like Job... Usually, we just see what's going on right in front of our eyes in our own lives. And this book is meant to be an encouragement to us because we're allowed to look at human suffering from the outside. And we realize Job's experience is actually everyone's experience. Maybe your experience is showing God to someone who needs to see him and can't see him except through your life. And what you're walking through. Because you know what? Anybody can say God is good when they get what they want. Lots of people say, oh yeah, God has been so good to me. When they get exactly what they want. But in the grand scheme of things, I believe that God may actually be more glorified. Uh, our, our stories of God may actually be more believable. Sometimes by the way that you handle pain than by how much you praise God when you're getting all the blessings. God can use your pain. The book of Job is proof because it's encouraged so many people who have gone through the kinds of struggles and suffering that Job went through. God can use your pain. Your greatest ministry to this world may come out of your greatest hurt. The very things that you have resented or regretted may be what God can use to help other people that are going through similar things in their lives. And w without pain, without pain, we would not know what courage is. Without pain, we would not know what steadfastness is. Without pain, we would not know triumph. And in fact, Jesus himself saw pain as the pathway to victory. And I want to encourage you with this final passage from 2 Timothy chapter 8 or chapter 2 verses 8 to 13 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8 it's a passage that has encouraged me when i have felt like giving up and when i wondered whether i could hang on it says remember jesus christ raised from the dead descended from david this is my gospel for which I'm suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. The Apostle Paul is writing this. He is an eyewitness of Jesus, handpicked by Jesus to serve him. And he says, remember Jesus who died but was also raised from the dead. Remember that in the worst of times. And also he says, and I'm suffering to the point of being chained, but I know that God's word is not chained. This is not the end of the story. Therefore, he says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, the people that God has chosen for his family, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 
Like, just remember that in the midst of pain. Pain is the pathway to victory, and Jesus leads the way and, and, and provides that safety, that healing, that forgiveness, that eternity for us. Jesus went through pain, like many of us go through pain, but here's the difference. Jesus went through it alone. We call out to God and receive comfort from God. Jesus didn't. He went through it all alone. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that we could be remembered. He suffered alone in our place so that we could be accepted and welcomed and given his place in heaven. And if if you know Jesus, if you've given your life to him, then his pain is your victory. If you know Jesus, then his rejection becomes your acceptance. But what about the days, and there will be those days, when you feel like you can't even hang on to that? And that is the question that that people struggle with. What about the days where I struggle even to believe this? Okay, so here's what Paul says next, and this is so important for the believer. He says, here's a trustworthy saying. That means hang on to this. This is truth. If we died with him, we will also live with him. So this is for people who have died to themselves, died to their old way of life, put their trust in Jesus, and begun a relationship of faith in him. If we died with him, we will always also live with him. There's the promise. If we endure, we will also reign with him. What if I can't endure? If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. So if if you died to your old life and have given your life to Jesus, then you have the promise of eternal life. And if we endure, we will reign with him. Some will disown Jesus. They will abandon their faith. They will reject it. It is disputable whether those people ever had true faith. But some will walk away and reject Jesus and say, I want nothing to do with him anymore. They will actively disown him. They are not his. He will disown them. But what about someone who has truly trusted Jesus and then has this terrible day and acts in a way that does not demonstrate faith? What about a person who has given their life to Jesus and then slips into sin? Here's the promise. Here's the promise. If we are faithless, he says, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. You haven't rejected him. He's living inside of you. You've blown it, but he's there, and he can't reject himself, and he's in you. And that brings hope on our worst of days. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And so I want to send you off wherever you're headed, and whatever is coming your way, with this blessing, this benediction over you. It's based on 1 Peter chapter 5. Receive this today. So humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may lift you up in due time cast all your cares on him for he cares about you and may the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while restore you and establish you and strengthen you and support you his glory and your joy.